Thank you, choir. Thank you to our music ministry. And we have done well without technology today. I see Rick up there moving quickly, but sometimes computers don't behave even with the best of preparation and intentions. But we used to do church without computers, and today we've proven we can do it. That's good. As I said to you, Today is a topical message focusing on the subject, not often heard in church, the subject of fasting. You therefore have an option, that is to listen, I hope you will, to find Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 16, 17, and 18. Wait for me, I'll eventually get there. Or try, as best as you can, with skills you learned in Bible drill, to follow every verse that I will read without giving you the time to find. It's up to you, but I'm, I'm telling you up front, so that you won't get as upset with me as, as you would have. And what I will do for those who are note takers, I will repeat the references so that at least you can write them down and look at them as the Lord leads later. If I said, I'm going to fast, the Meridian Police Department might warn me, you better not in our jurisdiction. If I said, I'm going to fast, my wife would chuckle. This I gotta see because you've never done anything fast. You realize that the English word fast isn't just an adverb, meaning quickly, rapidly, recklessly, ahead of a correct time or a posted schedule in a firm or a fixed manner or close near. The English word fast is also a noun and a verb. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew noun and verb translated fast derived from the primary idea, mouth being shut. Mouth being shut. In the New Testament, the Greek noun translated fast literally means not to eat. Not to eat. Fasting is not dieting. However, its purposes are submitting to God and soliciting His attention. Submitting to God and soliciting His attention. Not shedding those extra pounds. Its process is the sacrificing of personal will. The sacrificing of personal will more than skipping a meal. Fasting logically accompanies prayer 16 times in 15 different biblical books. I'll give you a sampling. Listen to Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. Verses 1 through 3. Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek Him by prayer 
and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Listen to Luke's Gospel. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 36 and 37. Luke chapter 2, verse 36 and 37. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Manuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with the husband seven years after her marriage. And then, as a widow to the age of 84, she never left the temple, serving night and day with fastings and prayers. Listen to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Now there was an Antioch in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Nagur, and Lucius of Serene, and Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Finally, listen to Acts chapter 14. Acts 14, verse 23. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Fasting logically accompanies prayer 16 times in 15 different biblical books. And I just read for you while you listen to four of those examples. Y'all, as Nancy did well, during our children's message, fasting frees time <coughs> for prayer. Fasting is a means to a greater end. Fasting frees time <coughs> for prayer. The minutes normally spent preparing or procuring the meal, and if you're headed to one of the many fast food restaurants that you know, especially in Clinton, I'm warning you, they're not fast. They're not fast. We have the world's worst McDonald's, worst KFC, worst Wendy's, and worst Pizza Hut. So live in Meridian. Don't, don't, don't come to Clinton, Mississippi. But if you are preparing a meal or procuring a meal, and especially if you're going to wait in the line to get something, it's not fast. That's a lot of minutes spent. But in addition to that, normally those minutes spent preparing or procuring the meal, eating the meal, and cleaning up afterwards. Those are minutes saved when you fast the meal. And those minutes can be spent praying. Fasting frees time for praying, those minutes normally spent associated with a meal. Fasting enables focused prayer. Focused prayer. Because food is no longer a diversion. It's not taking up any of your, your mental thought and your physical energy. Fasting is needs-driven. More about that in a moment with some scriptural examples. Fasting is needs-driven. Hear the next statement carefully. Prayer is not needs-driven. What? Too many Christians think, I pray when I need something. Wrong. Wrong. No wonder too many Christians struggle with every day because they're not talking to Jesus. Did you hear the child when Nancy asked the question, why do we pray? And that sweet girl said, to get to talk to Jesus. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Prayer is not needs driven. Prayer is relationship driven. Why do you pray? Because you have a personal relationship with God. You love Him. And any love relationship requires communication. What kind of relationship would it be if two individuals only broke silence if one needed something from the other? And after one said, I need, one never said anything else until the next day. How long will that kind of relationship last? It won't. It won't. Prayer is relationship driven. Fasting is needs driven, as we can see from the Old Testament to the New Testament. When King Saul died in battle, his body decapitated, then displayed as a, as a sign of humiliation by the victorious Philistines. The inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead, who really loved Saul, the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead fasted seven days. While the newborn son of King David and Bathsheba suffered, stricken with some terminal illness, David prayed. After a prophet announced impending judgment, King Ahab humbled himself and prayed. So did the Ninevites. Go to the book of Jonah and you find after Jonah announced God would destroy that city, the entire city humbled themselves and they prayed. As a response from its national leaders to calls for repentance by such men as Samuel, Nehemiah, and Joel, the Israelites fasted. Prior to an invasion by hostile armies, King Jehoshaphat and Judah fasted. Awaiting a death sentence, the genocide of Jews, Queen Esther and her countrymen fasted. During unjust attacks by personal foes, we have the testimony of two psalmists, both of whom fasted. Because his best friend had been cast in a den of lions, King Darius fasted. In Babylon, far from home, homesick, the Jewish exiles fasted. Before the devil tempted him in the wilderness, Jesus fasted. Prayer according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. Ought not cease. Why? Because your relationship with God is eternal. Ongoing. And as long as you have a relationship with Him, you pray. Prayer according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. Ought not cease. Fasting being needs driven ought not continue whenever the need ceases. Listen to Zechariah. Listen to Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 19. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 19. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth months will become joy, gladness, and cheerful feasts for the house of Judah. So love truth 
and peace. And listen to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 14 and 15. Matthew chapter 9, verse 14 and 15. Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, The attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Prayer, being relationship-driven, ought not cease. Fasting, being needs-driven, ought not continue whenever the need ceases. Effective fasting becomes empty ritual if, hear me, if the practicer, the one fasting, or the practice itself becomes the focus. Effective fasting becomes empty ritual if the practicer, the one fasting, or the practice itself becomes the focus. Consider four examples from the scripture. Listen to Isaiah chapter 58 verses 3 through 6. Isaiah chapter 58 verses 3 through 6. Why have we fasted and thou dost not see? Why have we humbled ourselves and thou dost not notice? Behold, on the day of your fast, you find your desire and drive hard to all Workers. Behold, you fast for contention and strife and to strike with a wicked fist. You do not fast like you do today to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast like this which I choose a day for a man to humble himself? Is it for bowing one's head like a reed and for spreading out sackcloth and ashes as a bed? Will you call this a fast, even an acceptable day to the Lord? Is this not the fast which I choose? To loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bonds of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke. What did you just hear? The people were going through the motion. They were fasting. But then they were continuing in their wicked practices. And God said, just because you do this, adding this to your inappropriate, disobedient behavior, doesn't make your inappropriate appropriate disobedient behavior go away. I'd rather you stop your disobedience. That would be a good fast. So these people thought, hey, we're doing it. The practice works, right? But they weren't changing their heart. And God saw through it. Listen to Jeremiah chapter 14, verses 10 through 12. Jeremiah chapter 14, verses 10 through 12. Thus says the Lord to this people, even so they have loved to wander. They've not kept their feet in check. Therefore the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and call their sins to account. So the Lord said to me, do not pray for the welfare of this people. When they fast, I'm not going to listen to their cry. And when they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I'm not going to accept them. Rather, I'm going to make an end of them by the sword, famine, and pestilence. Once again, y'all, it's not enough just to go through the motions and do the practice as if this is the magic bullet. If we do this, oh yeah, God will overlook everything else and God will, will, will bow to our will. No, we, we don't manipulate God with fasting. And if we only focus on the practice, we've missed the point. We've wasted our time. The folks listening to Jeremiah had not figured that out yet. Zechariah chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. This is the third of, of four passages before we draw to a conclusion. Zechariah chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Then it came about in the fourth year of King Darius that the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, which is his lamb. Now the town of Bethel had sent Sharazir and Regemelech and their men to seek the favor of the Lord, speaking to the priests who belonged to the house of the Lord of hosts and to the prophets, saying, Shall I weep in the fifth month? 
and abstain, as I've done these many years? Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Say to all the people of the land and to the priests, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seven months, these seventy years, was it actually for me that you fasted? And when you eat and drink, do you not eat for yourself? And do you not drink for yourselves? Once again, the focus was on the practice rather than upon the Lord. And the Lord said, you've been doing it these months for 70 years, but I'm not impressed. Hadn't moved me at all. Because you're just doing it because you think you need to do it. And you've not paid attention to me. Finally, we get to that place in Matthew's Gospel. You've been waiting patiently and you didn't realize that this was the end of the sermon. Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, 17, and 18. Here, Jesus is talking about fasting. And notice how he, how he speaks to his disciples. And whenever you fast. So he's not mandating that it has to be weekly, monthly, or even annually. He says whenever. And whenever you fast. Do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. For they neglect their appearance in order to be seen fasting by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. What's the problem here? The problem here is, the, is that the focus is not on God. The focus is on the one doing it. Hey, look at me. Boy, I'm spiritual. I'm fasting. I'm so miserable. I'm hungry. Aren't you impressed at how much I love God? Once again, wrong. We don't do this to get the attention. God must always be the focus in whatever we do. Jesus says, verse 17, but when you fast. So he didn't say if. Yeah. This is a spiritual discipline. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you may not be seen fasting by men but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will repay you. Leads us to the question, why fast? Why? On April 12, 1980, Canadian Terry Fox dipped his right shoe in the Atlantic Ocean, just off the coast of Newfoundland, then began jogging westward across Canada. Jogging. Every day, for four and a half months, he trekked nearly 30 miles. Every day, for four and a half months, he endured excruciating pain. You see, Terry Fox was dying. One of cancer's many victims. At age 22, doctors amputated his right leg below the knee to halt the spread of tumors. Terry learn to walk again with the aid of an artificial leg, but he could no longer run. So to watch him, he trotted. And during that fox trot across Canada, the cancer eventually spread to his lungs, forcing him to quit after he had logged 3,000 339 road runs. The disease eventually took his life. Why did Terry Fox subject himself to such exhaustion every day for four and a half months? Because raising funds to find cancer's cure to him was worth it. Pain would have wrapped his body no matter what he did. And Terry's efforts as of January of this year have raised over $750 million for cancer research. And the Terry Fox Run is an annual event that occurs in the month of September. It was worth it to him. And so the question, which is really the answer to the question, why fast? Answering a question with a question, really? Yes. Here's the answer 
to the question, why fast? And it's a question. Besides work, sports, or physical appearance, is anything spiritual worth you're missing a meal? Some of you, well, most of you probably, were here when I shared the, the greatest heartache to date. I don't know about tomorrow, but today, the greatest heartache that, that I have ever endured. And that was in the fall of 2013 when our daughter, our precious daughter, Anne Marie, at the beginning of her junior year, manifested clinical depression. Oh, horrible. Even uh, My wife can't even think about it. It, it, it just it, it pains her too much and, and, and she tears up immediately. We prayed. We had no idea what we were facing. We really didn't. Thankful God did. And God intervened. Though we were clueless. I was a psych painter in college, so I knew just enough to be dangerous. There was something amiss. Something was not right. And Amory went to see the doctor. They ran a battery of physical tests. Unfortunately, I, I, uh, the results were all negative. I wish that they were positive because I thought, great, it's not a physical problem. It's a psychological problem. So, thankfully, we got Amory a wonderful psychiatrist who, who attends First Baptist Church Jackson, Mississippi, and her counselor, dear friend of ours, at the time, worked through the counseling ministry of First Baptist Church Jackson. Boy, Anne Marie turned around, especially with the, the medication that she took. She was on several meds. We had the Anne Marie back that we, we had been missing for several weeks. I mean, once again, she had expression, she had energy, she, she, she was laughing again. It was, it was wonderful. The counselor, our friend Dottie Hudson at First Baptist Church Jackson, um, had announced, well, we don't need to see each other every week. It, it can be every couple of weeks, and then we'll go from there. The psychiatrist, Dr. Bishop, was saying to Anne Marie and to us, hey, she's doing so great. We're going we're to lower the dosages of the medication. She's doing wonderful. And then in October, she bottomed out again on the meds. And now we were wondering, what do we do? Oh God, what do we do? We've done everything. And we're, we're, we're worse off. Because now this psychology major, observing her behavior, noted, now she's manifesting manic behavior. And that really panicked me because I thought bipolar disorder. Oh no. Marianne took Emory, we made an emergency appointment to see the psychiatrist. It was on a Friday, November the 1st, 2013. I couldn't go because I had classes that morning. Marianne only teaches on Tuesday, Thursday. But the Lord impressed upon me fast. I was already praying. Y'all, I was at wit's end. Nobody had to convince me. This is a pretty significant situation. This is a real spiritual need. I didn't tell anybody because I, I was aware of scripture. I, I didn't want to announce, hey everybody, look how spiritual I am. I'm fasting, you know. So Marianne didn't even know. My daughter didn't know. And what I did, the Lord laid it upon my heart, is on that Friday, November 1, or the next four Fridays, I fasted. Was it ambitious? No. All I did was I fasted lunch. That's all I did. But during that time, I just poured out my heart and I prayed to the Lord. Because I knew my daughter was worth skipping a meal. Why fast? Well, I'm going to answer that question with a question. Besides work, sports, or physical appearance, is anything spiritual worth your missing a meal? I hope that you'll read Paige's article in the Evangel. Well written. Paige is a member of our pastor's 
church committee. And our pastor search committee has already fasted. They have fasted. And what they're asking us is to keep on doing what we're doing, and that's praying, but to raise that to another level and to unite with them, if possible, based upon your physical situation, to unite with them this week. Pick, pick a day. However ambitious you do as God leads, because it's not about the practice itself, and it's not about you, but it's you taking the time to focus on the Lord. Why? Because this wonderful church is worth it. This amazing church is worth it. I love Highland. You all love Highland even more because you've been a part of this church a whole lot longer. And when I'm on, you'll still be here loving this church. This church has meant a lot to you. Of course, those are all reasons to fast. Thank you, Nancy, for expressing what also appears in Paige's article, that there's so many ways to do this. And of course, your physical well-being is of utmost importance. If you can't fast food, that's not a pun. If you cannot fast food, we understand. Don't do anything apart from what your doctor has indicated. You may have medications and that requires that you take food with your medication. Well, that means you can't fast food, but you could fast something else. When I teach my students at Mississippi College, I tell them, I like to eat as much as the, 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 the next person. So could it be that what you so choose to do is, and I don't, I'm, I can see my students already getting real excited when I talk to them. You know, I can see their expression. You could fast sleep. You could wake up 30 minutes, an hour sooner than you typically do and use that time to pray. Whatever time that you spend on Netflix or Amazon Prime or TV, if anyone does watch TV anymore, I don't know. You could say, okay, I'm giving up that hour, or I'm giving up that two hours, and I'm going to use that. Pray. For those who are my generation and a little bit older, I'm not looking at anybody specifically, so don't feel like I'm getting personal. You could be like my father-in-law. My father-in-law, one of his practices every day is to read from cover to cover the paper. Could it be that one of these days you choose not to? And the time that you say, see, I wouldn't say that to the young people because they have no idea of reading a newspaper. Who does that? But some of you do. Could it be that you could give up that time and say, God, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. You don't have to fast food. As God leads, you pray. And then pick a day to do the fast whatever way God wants you. If you want to be ambitious and fast all three meals, praise the Lord, do it. But if you even say, God, I'm just going to fast one meal. I think I can do one meal, and I'm going to use that time to pray. Of course, God's pleased. Why? Because you're focusing on Him. You know, as I was driving over today, I had peace because I thought, you know, the question, what pleases God? It's not a mystery. It's right here. It's spelled out. What moves God's heart? It's not a mystery. It's all spelled out right here. And the very things that pleased Him and moved His heart during the biblical time period are the same things that please Him and move His heart today. It's not a guessing game. Y'all, even King Ahab, y'all know the Bible? Ahab and his wicked wife Jezebel, I mean, these are infamous people. Ahab humbled himself and fasted. And you know what? It moved God's heart. God said, I've seen my servant Ahab, and I'm responding. So I can't imagine when this righteous church does the very same thing this week. This is not legalism. I'm not telling you what to do, when to do it, how often to do it. That is as the Lord leads. Ultimately, passionately, pour out your heart to Him. Lift up this church to Him. The men and women who serve us.
so diligently on our pastor search committee for that man of God whom God has already prepared to come here. I hear y'all. I don't think anybody thought that Ivan Park would still be your interim in the second year. Right. I know. Y'all are ready for a pastor. God knows the right time. I don't take that personally. I'm your pastor for a season. But I do know the Lord, oh, the Lord's best. That's worth praying for. Get excited about it. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for how you move among us and how you lead. Clearly, it will listen. We also thank you that you are approachable, that you respond when we cry out to you, that you have a tender heart, that you listen to our prayers, and you see when we feel the burden, and we know we can't take another step, and so we feel led to go even further, to fast as well as pray. And we thank you that in those moments, whenever that happens in our lives, like it will happen in the life of the church this week, you provide exactly what we need. And what we need is more of you. We need your direction. We need you to show us your will. And we pray that you hold our hand and order our steps. Lord, we, we really pray for the nine wonderful men and women on our pastor search committee. We thank you for them. They have worked so hard, praying fervently, meeting regularly. We pray especially for them that your hand would be upon them. You fill them with your spirit. You hold their hand and order their steps. Confirm if that's what they need. Open a door if that's what they need. Give them a different direction if that's what they need. You know best. And that's all we're asking that you do what you can do. Therefore, you will receive the glory and the credit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Paul will lead us in a hymn of invitation. Clint and I will stand before you. This scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 1 through 18, where Jesus highlighted a lot of good things to do. Pray, giving alms to the poor, forgiving one another, and fasting. All of those are good things. What's the problem? Good things, when not done for the right reason, are simply ritual. And they don't move God's heart. In other words, you've got to do the right thing for the right reason. Otherwise, all you're doing is being religious. Christianity is not. Yes, it is a religion. But, but what the gospel is, the gospel is about a relationship. We don't need more religious people. We've got a lot of them in this world of different religions. What we need is more folk that have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. Which then makes fasting, praying, giving to the poor, coming to church, bringing your Bible, all those things meaningful. But apart from a personal relationship with God, none of that matters. As good as it is, eternally, none of that matters. Do you have a relationship with God? If you don't, would you give Clint and I the privilege to talk to you about Jesus? Thank you, Paul. Would you stand, please?
one little part of it. God is faithful. If you would, together, faithful, you are faithful.